Chapter 22 deals with infections uh, associated with the respiratory system. This is kind of a classic picture that I think is in every single book that talks about respiratory diseases. Um, some people may not want to see it, but it just shows how a lot of diseases are spread by aerosol droplets in the air. And some people don't realize the amount of material <laughs> that comes out of their mouth when they cough and they sneeze. Just a brief uh, summary of the anatomy associated with the respiratory system. The upper respiratory system is um, considered anything above the epiglottis. It has contact with the external environment. There are quite a number of resonant microorganisms, meaning that um, they're there all the time. It's quite a diverse group. So uh, it's going to include the nasal cavity, the mouth, the pharynx, uh, if you've had AMP, you would remember that it's divided into three sections, the nasal pharynx, ornopharynx, and laryngeopharynx. And then the laryngeopharynx, the bottom of it, that's, you're at the epiglottis. End. The lower respiratory is below that epiglottis. It has very few transient microorganisms. This is going to include the larynx, the trachea, the bronchia, the bronchioles, and the alveolite that are in the lungs themselves. And so in this particular um, diagram over here on the right, you can see certainly that you've got the nasal cavity here. Um, so you're breathing in the air. The air is coming in, but, but so is anything else that may be on droplets, dust particles, pollen particles, and so that's why you have a very high potential of introducing foreign substances here. Uh, right here is the opening for the eustachian tube. It comes down and it's right here. You have, there's the nasal pharynx, which is the top portion. You have the ornopharynx and the laryngeopharynx. So all of this is the pharynx right here. Um, the larynx, you can see, is right here. Here's the epiglottis that it marks that uh, distinction point right between the um, upper and the lower respiratory system on there. Over here on the left, we have a diagram of the ear. You have the external ear, which is uh, what everybody sees as the ear, the outer portion, and then you've got your ear canal, uh, which the whole purpose is to bring the sound waves in and it's going to amplify them. The tympanic membrane, that's what is commonly referred to as your eardrum, and that is the separation between the external ear and the middle ear. The middle ear does contain the three auditory obstacles, the malus, incus, and stapes, those bones in the uh, middle ear. And the reason we're mentioning this is because the middle ear does have the eustachian tube right here which over here, as you can see, it does drain down into um, the very, right the connection between the nasal pharynx and the nasal cavity right in the back there. And that becomes important because if things are in the nasal cavity, there is a potential that it can move up that station tube. And there are some instances where we do see that. So that's just kind of a brief introduction to the anatomy. With the lower respiratory system now, it's, as we said, everything below the epiglottis. Once again, here's the epiglottis. So that's going to include the larynx, the trachea. As you move down then actually into the lungs, you've got the bronchial tubes which are separated into the primary, the secondary, the tertiary. Finally, the bronchiolus. Each of these are getting smaller and smaller in diameter. And eventually down into the terminal bronchioli, which then feeds, and you're finally down into the alveoli sacs. This is where the gas exchange is actually going to occur. Because it is um, so deep in the body, like I say, the further you go down, the fewer and fewer and fewer microorganisms are naturally found there. 
So once again, the station tube drains that middle ear into the nasal pharynx. Um, one issue with the station tube is that it is more horizontal in young infants, and then as you age, it becomes a little bit more vertical, uh, relatively speaking. Because it is more horizontal, one problem we have with infants, especially if they are still drinking from a bottle, if they are lying down, it's easier for fluid in the mouth to move up the station tube into the middle ear, and then you end up with the ear infection. Uh, the lacrimal ducts, nasal lacrimal ducts, remember the tears, uh, they, when tears are pr produced, they flush across the eye, drain into the, uh, through the tear ducts into the nasal lacrimal uh, ducts, which are, are on either side of the nose, and those drain into the nasal cavity. Pointing all these out as, as potential entry points for any type of um, microorganisms. The palatine tonsils are in the ornopharynx, um, and like throughout the trachea, you have mucus and ciliated cells uh, that are producing mucus and then having it move along up the trachea. It's helping to prevent microorganisms from penetrating deeper. You, you produce that mucus, which must be known as phlegm, where it's being flushed up and then you cough it out. For a lot of our respiratory diseases, there are vaccines available. And this drawing is just showing um, on the surface, epithelial cells are always on the surface. They always have one exposed surface. And this is just showing that on this, you do have cilia on here. Goblet cells produce the mucus, so they are able to produce that mucus and the cilia gets it moving and just moves it right along. It's hard for microorganisms to get established with that. Signs and symptoms of respiratory infections. Rhinitis, simply uh, inflammation in the nasal cavities. You see this a lot with common cold, hay fever. Sinusitis is inflammation of sinuses. Otitis, inflammation of the ear, otitis medias with the middle ear specifically. Pharyngitis is inflammation of the pharynx, commonly referred to as a sore throat. Laryngitis is inflammation of the larynx. You may be familiar with laryngitis. Oftentimes, um, it affects your ability to, to speak because that's where your vocal cords are. So if it's inflamed, it may be hard to speak. Uh, tonsillitis, inflammation of the tonsils. Epiglottitis is inflammation of the epiglottis. Bronchitis, inflammation of those bronchial tubes in the lungs. Pneumonia is inflammation and infection of the alveoli. This, that is where, remember, the gas exchange incur, occurs, and so that's why it certainly affects breathing ability. So just as in the previous chapter, um, we're going to start with bacterial infections. Streptococcus pyogenes. Now you're going to see, because we divide this up by systems within the human body, Several of these organisms, whether they're bacteria or viruses or fungi, you may see that they can infect multiple different systems. So basically, you may see a lot of these players again. Streptococcus pyogenes, as we call that as a gram positive. Uh, coccus, it tends to occur in chains. This can spread very easily by uh, direct contact as well as droplets, sneezing coughing, things like that. It causes pharyngitis, uh, commonly because it is a streptococcus, it's typically known as strep throat. If it is not treated, it can eventually um, cause additional problems such as rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis. That's um, a disease with the kidneys. Streptococcus pyogenes can also cause scarlet fever. These, uh, both uh, the strep throat and the scarlet fever, you can treat with antibiotics. This is really, I think, kind of a cool uh, scanning electron micrograph of the streptococcus. It's okay, I'm a science nerd. So, I, to me, looking at it, you just have those perfect cocci there and in those nice chains. It's just a wonderful picture, in my opinion. <clears throat> so, with strep throat, 
many of you have probably had it because a lot of people get it. You have that sore throat. You tend to have bright redness with the inflammation in the throat. Oftentimes you have these little dark spots associated with it as well. So on the left here, this is an individual that has strep throat. Scarlet fever, you typically end up with a rash. That is what is shown here. Uh, on the skin, it, why is it included here is because inhalation is how you get it. You get it through the respiratory system and then it travels and it causes the rash on the skin. So this is where sometimes it's hard to put diseases in a certain box by system because the systems are all interconnected. So, yeah, the point of entry might be through the respiratory system, so we put it there. But ultimately, the pathogen travels maybe to a different area of the body and then starts affecting a different organ in a different system. Acute otis media. This is the middle ear infection, which probably every child has always had at some point. Every parent has had to deal with this. As you can see, there's a whole list of different bacteria that can cause it. There's Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is a gram positive. Escherichia coli, which is E. coli, is gram negative. Enterococcus, various species of that, can cause it, and those are gram positive. What we call group B Streptococcus species, um, gram positive. Haemophilus influenza, gram negative. Miraxilla catarrh, gram negative. So you're talking about both gram positive and gram negatives. And like I say, it's fairly common with children. They get pulling on their ears or they complain about their ears hurting. You treat this with antibiotics. Amoxicillin is the number one choice of antibiotic to use for a middle ear infection. So on this series of pictures over here on the left, this is a healthy, normal ear. You know when the doctor takes that little line and instrument and he's looking in, in your ear? This is what he sees. The, um, I mean, excuse me, I'm trying to get the, a color here to show where I don't obstruct the picture too much. This clear membrane through here, that is the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. You can see through it in a healthy, normal individual that middle ear should be filled with air. There should be no fluid in it. So you can easily see the bones that are in there. As you can see here, it's labeled. Here's the malus. Here's the incus. You can see them in there. Unfortunately, over on this picture on the right-hand side, here's the malus. Here's the incus. You can kind of make it out there. Um, you can also see a whole lot of this right in here. That's mucus because there's fluid in there. It looks right here as though the membrane is actually torn. If you produce enough mucus, you will build pressure up against the membrane and you may end up with a tear. Now it can repair itself. Um, but that's why the uh, ear infection hurts. You, you've got that fluid and that mucus that's building up in there. It needs to go somewhere. So, like I said, middle ear infections, I think every child has had one. <coughs> Carinibacterium diphtheriae. This is a gram positive bacillus. It can be transmitted by droplets and aerosols, so coughing, sneezing, things like that can transmit it from one person to another. This particular bacteria produces a toxin. So that's part of the problem is that it produces a toxin. And then through the course of the disease, it also produces what's called a pseudomembrane. This disease is diphtheria. If, a, if it advances to the point where a pseudomembrane is formed, you need to remove that pseudomembrane because it starts to form across the, um, the pharynx and it can interfere with breathing. It can actually um, suffocate if it's not removed. There is a vaccine that is available that helps prevent this disease. You can also treat it with antibiotics. You can also treat it with antitoxins uh, that try to neutralize the toxin that is produced. 
the pseudo membrane. This is what is shown in this picture right here. The structure that's sitting down right there. That is the pseudo membrane. You do not want it to go all the way across because then it would suffocate the individual. So that has to be removed. The best thing is get the vaccine and then you won't get sick and you don't have to deal with any of it. Pneumonia. Remember this is infection in the alveoli where the gas exchange actually occurs. There, as you can see, many, many different bacteria that can cause pneumonia. Here's the list of them. You've got Streptococcus pneumoniae, that's a gram positive. Haemophilus influenza, gram negative. Mycoplasm pneumoniae, gram negative. Pseudomonas originosa, gram negative. Klebsiella pneumoniae, gram negative. Camphlophilia pneumoniae, gram negative. Camphlophilia sauce, gram negative. Uh, Chlamydia tracheum, negative. Staphylococcus aureus, gram positive. You can treat all these with antibiotics. Once again, something that's going to help you out is to get the quickest and best treatment is to be able to identify the bacteria. Uh, so you can use a narrow spectrum antibiotic geared towards, say, Streptococcus versus Pseudomonas. Oftentimes, uh, symptoms can start to indicate that yeah, I think a person has pneumonia, but then you can do a chest x-ray. Are you seeing any lesions, any cloudiness in the x-ray? When you look at an x-ray of the lungs, it should be nice and clear. It should not have these whitish spots on it. That's indicating infection. Looking at... Uh, the uh, a stain of the streptococcus pneumoniae it's in here in some of these areas where you can see it streptococcus pneumoniae typically is two cells together two cocci together instead of having a long chain this is Haemophilus influenza that's grown on a chocolate auger plate so once again depending on what you're working with you might grow it on different media Mycobacterium tuberculosa. This is what we call an acid fast uh, bacillus. Some books will classify it as a gram positive. The problem with the genus Mycobacterium is that all of those, it's really hard for them to pick up the gram stain properly. So you, you normally don't list it as a gram positive. Because it has a lot of extra waxy uh, mycolic acid in the cell wall, that's why it's hard for it to pick up the gram stain. So instead you do an acid fasting. So I know some books record it as a gram positive, but mostly you will see it recorded as an acid fast. Um, it's bacillus shape. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is very slow growing. I'm talking in the lab um you when you're trying to culture and then grow it it, it may take a couple weeks sometimes for it to grow it does not grow in 18 24 hours like most bacteria it is a causative agent for tuberculosis it's transmitted by droplets and aerosols so once again you know we're talking sneezing coughing etc um there is a vaccine that is available. It's available for healthcare workers, military. It's not out really for the general public. Um, one of the problems with tuberculosis, you can treat it and they do treat it with antibiotics. Just be aware that it's very long term. I know years ago it was 18 months and then they finally got it down to nine months. So I'm talking long term and that's one of the problems with trying to control this disease is that sometimes it's hard to get people to take an antibiotic for 10 days. So can you imagine trying to get them to take it for several months? People get forgetful, they get lax, they get tired of doing it. But to be fully treated, you need to take the antibiotics for the full length of time. And like I said, that 
that becomes very difficult sometimes. And so then you end up with carriers, people who are no longer showing symptoms, but they can still transmit it. And because they're transmitted by droplets and aerosols, every time they cough, every time they sneeze, they could potentially be releasing some of these bacteria, which then, you know, someone else can inhale and, and become infected. There are some issues with um, some resistant uh, strains of mycobacterium tuberculosis also showing up, and that's a, a problem now when you have some that are becoming resistant to the normal antibiotics that you would use. Now you've got to figure something else to do to treat it. One of the problems as to why it's so hard to treat it is that when the bacteria comes in and infects an individual, it walls itself off and that makes it very difficult for your immune system then to attack it. And then at any point it can kind of break that wall, break that little vesicle around it, and then release the bacteria from there. One of the testings to see if you have been exposed, there's a standard uh, tuberculosis test. You uh, receive an injection um, and then the one catch with this is you have to read it in usually 48 hours. Don't wait more than 72, but it's usually 48 hours. You have to come back and you have to, to read the test. You look for redding, redness, swelling, hardness. What's the size of the area um, as to whether or not you've had exposure to TB or not? Um, most of your hospitals are going to require TB testing on a regular basis. Just be aware of that. Bordetella pertussis. This is a gram-negative bacteria. It's a coxobacillus, so remember that's the one that's kind of oval-shaped. It is a causative agent of whooping cough, which technically whooping cough is called pertussis, so that's how you get the species name. This is very highly contagious by droplet transmission, and so you need to be very careful if someone has this. Uh, try to isolate them, cover their mouth, etc. Now, part of the problem with it is that it produces a toxin, so you have to deal with the toxin that's being produced. There is a vaccine available, so hopefully everyone gets the pertussis um, vaccine, and then that eliminates a whole set of problems. You can treat it with antibiotics if someone does come down with it. Another respiratory disease caused by Legionella pneumophilia. This is a gram-negative bacillus. Um, <clears throat> it causes uh, Legionnaire's disease. It inhabits most uh, very moist environments. It's usually associated with air conditioners, and that's how they found it. Um, and that um, the water that's associated with the air conditioner. If it sits for a long period of time, bacteria are like, woohoo, this is a nice moist environment. We like this. And it can become, the water can become contaminated. As the air then is blowing over that water, it's blowing potentially these contaminants in the air and then people inhale it. And that's actually, that's how they found it was at a convention. Uh, the American Legion, that's how it got the name Legionella, and at their convention site, the air conditioning system uh, was, the water was contaminated with this. That's how they discovered it. <laughs> when you have 400 people getting sick, even it's not the food, you got to look elsewhere to see what it is. Because of that incident, commercial uh, air conditioners, part of the Federal requirement is that water must be completely recir or exchanged at least every eight hours and then replaced. If someone gets sick with this, they can be treated with antibiotics. Coxiella burnetti is the causative agent of Q fever. Uh, this can be, is transmitted by ticks and infected animals. You can treat it with antibiotics. So, you know, another thing with bacterial infections is that at least most of them you can treat with antibiotics. So that's the good news of it. Viral infections, um, with your respiratory tract infections, usually it's viral infections. They're the most common cause. They're usually fairly mild, you know, in a, 
relatively normal and healthy adult. They're usually mild. They're self-limiting. Um, just kind of let it run its course. Treat the symptoms. There's, for a lot of it, it's very um, few effective treatments. In other words, it may not be antibiotics that are effective. Antibiotics, as we've discussed before, are very hard against viral infections. There is a syndrome that is known as Ray syndrome. Um, what happens is an individual t with certain illnesses, when they develop the syndrome, they get swelling of the liver and the brain. So it seems to be associated, what they have finally found, is typically in children and teenagers are much higher risk of developing Ray syndrome. And what they have found is that if they have a viral infection, do not give them aspirin. There's some correlation there. We don't exactly know fully how it all works, um, but don't give them aspirin. You can give them, say, Tylenol. You can give them, depending on how high a fever is, et cetera, but don't give them aspirin. That's going to greatly increase the risk of developing the Rice syndrome. So with viral infections, number one, common cold. Um, and you may not want to see this, but there are over 200 different viruses that can cause the common cold. That's why there's never going to be a vaccine against it. Because <laughs> nobody wants to get uh, 200 shots. So, um, Besides that, common cold is usually not life-threatening. It's usually mild. It's irritating. It's annoying. Uh, get a box of Kleenex. You know, it's... How is it transmitted? Direct contact, droplet transmission again, you know, sneezing. You sneeze on a doorknob, somebody else goes and opens the doorknob, wipes their nose, and there you go. So what are some of the viruses that can cause this? Rhinoviruses, number one. Rhinoviruses are single-stranded RNA viruses. You have the coronaviruses. Not, okay, the coronavirus is a, a family name, so it's not just the one that you're thinking of with COVID. There's, that would be included in it, but there are several. They are also single-stranded RNA. And then you have adenoviruses, which are double-stranded DNA. As I said, there's really no treatment other than Kleenex. Influenza. That is a technical name that everybody calls the flu. It is a single-stranded RNA virus. Usually it's self-limiting, which means let it run its course. Um, who's at higher risk? Young infants and elderly. And one of the concerns you have when uh, elderly or young infants, elderly are at higher risk because their immune system starts kind of wearing down as they age. It's not as effective. Young infants, their immune system is not fully up and running and functional yet. The concern is not only dealing with the disease of influenza, but they're also at a risk of getting a secondary infection. And one of the ones you're really concerned about is pneumonia. The virus is transmitted by direct contact and by inhaling aerosols. There is vaccine available. Uh, this virus tends to mutate very frequently. And so there's always a couple of different strains out, three, four strains usually at any one time. And so remember, your adaptive immune system is very, very specific. It can tell the difference between the different strains. So if you wonder, well, I got a flu shot last year, but why did I get the flu this year? Well, because it was a different strain. It was a different version of it. It mutated and your body, you know, wasn't prepared for the new one. That's why they recommend you get the vaccine every year. The way they decide what strain to make the vaccine against, what happens is, is the flu season tends to be during the winter. It usually starts in September, late September, early October. And then you see it really peaking in the middle of the winter, you know, December, January, February. And then it will start to kind of decrease in spring, in uh, March. And so what happens? Um, 
the CDC, there's a, a group of specialists, virologists who study viruses, who are specialized with influenza and what they do, they're associated with the CDC. You're supposed to be uh, reporting incidences of influenza. So what they do in the U.S., the CDC looks to see what were the top three or four strains of flu of influenza in the spring. They also compare this with their uh, colleagues and their counterparts in Europe and Asia and South America and Australia and they um, and you know all over to figure out are we all seeing this the same major strains sometimes it's yes sometimes it's no so then what the CDC is going to do they're going to take the top three strains that were most prevalent in the spring and say okay that's what we're going to make uh, to use the, or develop the vaccine for next fall we're going to hopefully assume that what was most prevalent in the spring will be what is most prevalent next fall it takes a long time to make the vaccines. They have to grow the virus in um, chicken eggs, and they have to go grow them, and then process them, and sterilize them. And it, it's a, a lengthy process to go through. We also know that any time you pass viruses through eggs, you're going. There's a percentage there that increases chances of mutations. And so you're just kind of hedging your bets. <laughs> it's kind of a gamble that those three strains will be the predominant strains in the fall they they do fairly well but sometimes over the course of from spring until when fall comes there might be another mutation and there might be a brand new strain out well that wasn't part of the vaccine and now it's too late to include it in it and you have higher numbers of people getting infected with the influenza they're doing the best they can on it um and usually you don't want to in a vaccine you really don't want to do sometimes they'll have four but that's fairly rare because you really don't want more definitely not more than four because then the immune response is not as strong as it should be there um, are some drugs that you can use to treat when somebody has been diagnosed with influenza but you must start those at the onset if you wait too long then all you really need to do is treat symptoms the, the drugs that they have are effective only on the onset um, influenza if you do not receive treatment technically traditionally is going to last about a week to 10 days just FYI there is no such thing as a 24-hour flu that does not exist what most people call the 24-hour flu is a case of food poisoning I would look back 8 to 12 hours before you started getting sick and whatever you ate or drank you probably should not have this is showing a picture of what the influenza virus looks like when we talk where I've said before sometimes about the spikes and like H1N1 that's the designation from these spikes here <coughs> so a lot of people try to figure out okay what how do you tell the difference between common cold and influenza because when influenza starts to peak in the late fall and throughout winter that's also when a lot of people are getting colds so as we've said before it's very hard to diagnose just on symptoms this gives you a rough idea um, if you have a common cold you may have a fever but it's typically a low fever fever is going to be higher with influenza both of them you're going to probably have a headache aches and pains a common cold it should be mild it's going to be more severe with influenza feeling tired and fatigued well you might feel that a little bit with the common cold but it's going to be severe with influenza nasal congestion that's going to be very common with common cold you usually don't have that with influenza and sneezing you usually do not have with influenza but you do with the common cold so this is important for you guys to remember as i just said you can't diagnosed just by signs and symptoms 
because some of them are so similar between diseases. But on the other hand, it's also very important um, as workers in the healthcare field is to listen to your patient and also observe to your patient what are they complaining about. And when you're trying to figure out what, say, whether a patient has a cold or has the flu, if they're sitting there and they're all congested and they're sneezing, well, you might rule out influenza and lean definitely more towards the common cold. Notice these things. It's being aware, being observant. Now, with bacteria, we talked about bacterial pneumonia. This is now talking about viral pneumonia. Uh, viral pneumonia tends to be very highly contagious. Once again, your young infants and your elderly are at higher risk. There are several different viruses that can cause pneumonia. The adenovirus, which is a double-stranded DNA. Influenza virus, which is single-stranded RNA. Parainfluenza viruses, which is single-stranded RNA. And respiratory syncytial virus, which is known as RSV is also a single-stranded RNA virus. Uh, RSV, sometimes there are problems in that it typically peaks in the wintertime when the flu is peaking, and so it's another one that, okay, does somebody have um, influenza or do they have RSV? Which virus do they have? So you'll have to run some tests to, to figure that out. Uh, Last winter, during the winter of um, was the fall of 2023, and then uh, like January, February of 2024, we had something where we were seeing a, an increase in influenza. There was another peak of the COVID virus, and then there was also we were seeing a peak of RSV. All of them upper respiratory illnesses, which and well respiratory illnesses, which makes it more difficult. Very similar symptoms, and they were referring to it actually as the trifecta. Great, we've got these three different viruses, and we're trying to distinguish between them. And it was like good luck. The coronavirus, a single-stranded RNA. There are different uh, versions of this virus. SARS, which is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. The coronavirus caused that. That was diagnosed or recognized in uh, 2002. There was a huge outbreak in China at that point. MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, a very similar type of disease outbreak. It was in 2013, as the name implies, in the Middle East. It was also caused by coronavirus. And then, as a lot of people know, SARS has severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, COVID-2 in 2019. Um, the COVID just refers to coronavirus. Uh, it's called COVID-19 because it's the coronavirus, and 19 because it was discovered in 2019. As all of you are now aware, that became a pandemic. It is very uh, contagious, as we all know. It's very easily passed by droplet um, from one individual to another. There is a vaccine for the COVID. There are several, actually, uh, different companies, several different companies uh, came up with the vaccine. Um, just FYI, it was kind of an unusual situation. Uh, some of you may recall. And unfortunately, not all of this got uh, maybe the media attention or the public uh, information that it should have. The, <coughs> co the vaccine for COVID, a lot of people had concerns and felt that it was developed very, very quickly. And so then they had concerns over the safety of it. What we did not get out because it became a political issue instead of a public health issue. It should have always remained public health and not politicized. It is what it is. What we should have gotten out there was that the information in terms of developing the vaccine, which was very successful, it did reduce um, 
the number of cases dramatically once we finally were able to administer the vaccines. They did not make the vaccines overnight. And that's what a lot of people were like, oh, this is so fast, I don't know. Here's the thing. The coronavirus, as I just said, is an RNA virus. Behind the scenes, and this is what we did not get out, is that we had been working on trying to develop a, a vaccine against RNA viruses for 10 years before COVID ever even happened. Why? Because they were looking at things like HIV, Ebola, and trying to develop seeing for some of these diseases for where there's no cure, can we come up with a vaccine to protect people? So they were already working on that, on a general vaccine for a different virus, but they were still RNA virus. So when we had the outbreak of the coronavirus in 2019, and it became a pandemic and these horrible numbers of people dying, etc. Then when they said, okay, look, we need to see if we can come up with a vaccine that will protect people. We've already been working for 10 years working on an RNA virus. What we need to do is, this is an RNA virus, let's just switch and use the same techniques. We're just changing which virus we're working on. Put HIV, put Ebola, put that on hold. Now we're going to focus on the coronavirus. So they didn't start from scratch. They already had 10 years worth of work already done. You just switch out which virus you're working with and then that's why they were able to develop it so quickly. And unfortunately, that information was not always out there. You can treat the virus if you... Um, get a coronavirus you can treat it with uh, drugs you're trying to reduce the viral load that just means you're trying to reduce once again the number of viruses that you have and you're going to be treating the symptoms as well still working with viruses dealing with those that um the portal of entry is through the respiratory system, but you end up having skin rashes as well. Some of the symptoms are systematic. So once again, it's going to affect multiple systems. Everything's interconnected, like I said earlier. Some examples of these are like measles, uh, rubella, which is German measles, and chickenpox. So if you look at measles, which is known as rubella, it is a single-stranded RNA virus that causes this. This is highly, highly contagious. Um, there is a vaccine available. It has been available since uh, the 1960s. It has been very effective. The initial group that was vaccinated, they often feel might need to be tested to have boosters. Um, if you get measles, you get a rash. One classic thing is on the inner lining of the cheek, you see these white spots that are known as coplic spots. Now, measles, we were doing really well with the vaccines, certainly here in the US. Um, the number of cases after the vaccine came out dropped dramatically. Measles used to be considered one of those childhood diseases. Now, I remember when I was in school, which was way back in the dark ages, that I can remember when I was, studying that um, it was in the early 1980s and we were being told that the hope, the goal was to have measles eradicated from the United States by 1990. Um, I will just say now in 2024 right now, we haven't met that mark. <laughs> we, we missed it. Um, and we missed it kind of big time. Part of the problem that we have found is that if people are not getting boosters, then they don't have full protection over time. And the other big thing is, and we see this with a lot of diseases, because the number of cases have dropped dramatically, especially for young people who are thinking, oh, well, measles doesn't exist anymore. I don't see it anymore. So why should I be vaccinated? Or why should I vaccinate my kids? And so the number of people getting vaccinated has decreased, which means now they are susceptible. Measles, as I said, is highly contagious. It is one of the most contagious diseases there is. 
And so if you have somebody who has the virus and walks into a room and there are people in the room who have not been vaccinated, guess what? They are going to get it. Several years ago, we had a, a huge outbreak and they were able to trace it to somebody on spring break went to Florida, a college student. Okay, everybody wants to have fun on spring break and go on a vacation, and that's what this individual did, not knowing when they left and at the beginning of spring break that they had measles. Now they got sick later and realized, uh-oh, this is what I had. Think about that. College student spring break in Florida. How many people do you think that person came in contact with? And how many different places are people originating from that are spending spring break in Florida? And you could trace, I mean, it was kind of a nightmare. You could just trace from that one person and then later, you, you know, you started seeing this outbreak in Florida and then you start seeing in all these different states, well, what, where is it? Well, they could trace them all back to Florida. So, have we eradicated it? No, we have not. So, this is showing on the skin, the rashes. Once again, the rash that is <laughs> so many skin rashes, it's hard to tell. Um, up here, the little white spots, those are the couplet spots. Rubella, this is German measles. This is also a single-stranded RNA. This is also contagious. Not as contagious as the regular measles, but it is still contagious. There is a vaccine um, against this as well. The MMR is measles, mumps, rubella. That's what the R stands for. Um, rubella, this is going to be very dangerous for someone who is pregnant. The virus can pass uh, that placental barrier and so can pass from mom to the developing fetus with devastating uh, results. If it's during the first four months of the pregnancy, especially, it can be extremely dangerous. If a woman knows that she is wanting and uh, hoping to get pregnant, then beforehand they will oftentimes ask her if she has ever received the vaccine or had the disease. Nowadays it's usually, have you had the vaccine? And if not, they will recommend you get the vaccine prior to getting pregnant. They want to make sure that you are protected and you don't take this risk during the pregnancy. This is showing the rash with the German measles. And then varicella zoster virus. This uh, varicella is uh, the virus that causes chicken pox. It is a double-stranded DNA. Chicken pox is more severe if an adult gets it. Yes, it's annoying when anyone gets it, but um, it, it's more severe um, and more dangerous in an adult. Chicken pox is also very highly contagious was also considered one of the childhood diseases. Um, yes, it's annoying, you get the pox. Uh, the spots usually start on the scalp and work downward. That's just the way it kind of works. After you've gone through and you recover, the virus goes dormant in the nerves. Now, it's latent or it's dormant. It may never reoccur. It may stay there forever and you never have another problem. However, it may be reactivated as shingles, which is the zoster portion. Um, if a person has shingles, they could infect somebody with chicken pox. If the person has never had chicken pox, has never been vaccinated against chicken pox, somebody who has an active case of shingles could infect that individual with chicken pox. There are two separate vaccines. There's one for chicken pox and then there's one for shingles. On there. Um, like I say, the, the chicken pox uh, virus is, is highly, highly contagious. The exposure time. You, if you are exposed to somebody who has chicken pox, you may not show any signs or symptoms. <laughs> for 21 days. Um, I 
I know when my older brother started kindergarten, he came home with chicken pox, and my mother said initially, my sisters and I who were younger, she was trying to keep us separate, and then thought, what am I thinking? Well, just look. Let me just get through everybody with chicken pox at the same time. That's going to be so much easier. Um, years ago, I had a student who said that she was one of six kids. And when the oldest one came home and had chicken pox, her mother did the same thing. Everybody hug each other, you know, get nice and close um, with your siblings, hoping that all six of them would get it at once. And so the one, the first child had chicken pox. Nobody else got chicken pox until day 21. The second child got chicken pox. 21 days later, the third child got chicken pox. She had to deal with chicken pox for almost six months in her house. And I was like, oh, this poor, poor woman. Um, and I say, now we have the vaccines that are obviously very effective. There's no way of knowing ahead of time if somebody had chicken pox. There's no way of saying, oh, individual A, yes, it's going to reactivate a shingles, but not with individual B. There's no way of knowing that. So this is showing uh, the rash, the little pox that you get with the chicken pox. Um, like I say, it usually starts on the head and works down. And then this is the rash that you see with shingles. Shingles is very uh, painful. Moving on to fungal infections now. Histoplasma capsulum uh, causes histoplasmosis. For a lot of these diseases, if you see the full name of the causative agent, you can kind of figure out what disease it causes. It grows as a mold in the environment, but in human infections, it grows as a yeast. So it's one of these uh, we call dimorphic. It can switch back and forth. Remember, mold is multicellular, has the hyphal strands, but yeast is single uh, cell. Usually, the, it's transmitted by inhaling the spores. Your infants, your elderly, and your immunocompromised are at high risk. Usually it's self-limiting, which just means just let it run its course, treat the symptoms. However, there are some antifungal drugs that if it gets real severe, because normally it's somewhat mild, uh, but if it gets severe, there are some antifungal drugs that can be used. Coccidioides imminis causes coccidiomycosis. Once again, it's inhalation of the spores is how it's transmitted. This also is usually self-limiting and asymptomatic, um, meaning you're not showing any symptoms. However, for immunocompromised individuals, they may show symptoms. It is highly infectious, um, even though it's self-limiting and you can treat it with antifungal antibiotics. Because the spores are so easily dispersed, if you're working with it, you need to work with it in a BSL-3 uh, lab to try to prevent infection of your, your lab personnel. Obviously, people in the lab don't want to get sick. Um, and so just the structure, the way the spores are, they can be easily dispersed. So to prevent that work, a BSL-3 lab, remember, you have a safety uh, cabinet that you're working in, like a laminar flow hood, so that it would always keep the spores away from you. This is, uh, and it, once again, a lot of these are extreme cases that you're going to see of someone with uh, the facial lesions that it causes. And then over here on the right, using a fluorescent dye, you're able to see the spores there. Blastomyces dermatitis it causes blastomycosis. Once again, inhalation of the spores. This is usually fairly mild, self-limiting. Once again, except if you're immunocompromised. You're starting to see a pattern here. If you're immunocompromised, it's, your immune system is not working properly. That's going to make you more susceptible to anything and everything that's out there. You can treat this with antifungal um, antibiotics. And once again, here is blastomycosis shown here on this hand. And this is um, under the microscope. You can see what the yeast looks like, the yeast form of it. 
Miracle mycosis, there are a couple of different causative agents of this. Rhizopus, this has two different species names. They go back sometimes and change it. It's one thing that's kind of fr frustrating in the field of mycology when you're working with fungi, they change a lot of the different names. There are some other rhizopus species and mucor species that can also cause this. It's transmitted by inhalation of the spores, or you ingest the spores that's in food that's contaminated with it, or if you have a wound, it may, the spores may enter through the wound. Once again, immunocompromised are gonna be at greatest risk. You can treat this with antifungal uh, antibiotics again. Aspergillus fumigatus is the causative agent of aspergillosis. Here you go again, inhalation of the spores. Immunocompromised are going to be at the greatest risk. Yes, there are drugs that will help treat it. This is showing on an x-ray. Somebody that ha has had aspergillosis and in the lungs here, you can see this cloudiness, this kind of um, referred to as a fungal ball. You know, okay, yes, it's an infection. You need to treat that. Pneumocystis gerbeckii. This used to be known as Pneumocystis carinii. It causes um, Pneumocystis pneumonia. This, if you read in papers, you may see this associated more with AIDS. And the reason for that is it's not normally seen that often in the general public. Yes, you're immunocompromised and your premature infants are going to be at higher risk. It is fairly commonly seen in AIDS patients. This is something that when AIDS was first identified back in the early 80s, where all of a sudden you had these, typically they were healthy males and then suddenly they were getting sick. And then it was like their immune system was shutting off and what's going on. And they were trying to figure out what was going on going on here what's a common thread and they finally were able to identify the hiv virus and the disease associated with it of aids one of the things that was a common thread that they started to use as is a you know a common piece of the puzzle to figure out what was going on is you had individuals who were normally previously had been healthy and then they were suddenly coming down with pneumonia, pneumocystis pneumonia. Now at that time they referred to it as carinia. Like I just said, that's not generally seen in the general public. So it's like, whoa, this is kind of unusual that we're suddenly seeing this huge spike in this infection caused by this particular fungus. What is going on here? And so it, it really kind of helped them to find a commonality in these patients and then helped them with the whole discovery of HIV and AIDS. So it is still commonly seen in AIDS patients. Um, typically you're going to use uh, a combination of a couple different antifungal drugs to try to treat it. This is what it looks like, these dark purple uh, cells. You see it in the lung tissue, which it should not be in the lung tissue. Cryptococcus neoformans uh, causes cryptococciosis, inhalation of the spores. Once again, your immunocompromised are gonna be at higher risk. Treat it with antifungal drugs. Why is it that for some of these, we're saying just the immunocompromised are at a high risk and healthy individuals are not. That has to do with healthy individuals, your immune system. It's fighting against these foreign invaders so that you never get the progression to the disease. Remember, you can have an infection and not have the disease. Infection and disease are two different things. Infection is when the organism is in you and reproducing, but you may not be showing any symptoms. Disease is when now you have abnormal physiological functioning occurring. This is showing the cryptococcus cells as seen under the microscope. 